Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, think, I think the audience is going to grow through the day, according to our uh, information as far as the tickets are concerned. I'm, uh, I'm Mike Scott. Uh, I'm the director of the Georgetown University Future of the Humanities Project. I'm also senior advisor to the president of Georgetown University. And I'm also uh, very honored to be a fellow of Blackfriars and, uh, and the La Casas Institute. Uh, this is a series uh, starting today about the future of the humanities. Uh, it's going to be based here in Oxford, uh, sponsored by Georgetown and Georgetown's own sponsors. And, uh, but we are going to move around. Uh, so uh, we're certainly going to be the next one's going to be in the Dulwich Picture Gallery on the 18th of March, and that'll be on art history. Um, and then it looks as if we'll probably go and have one in Washington, uh, maybe one in the Silicon Valley. And although Georgetown don't know this yet, but we've also had an offer from Paris. I'm just looking at the vice president of Georgetown, just so that he still knows that. So uh, this, uh, this is about the humanities and, and the way in which the humanities can adapt, can adapt to uh, changing situations, can adapt to the way in, uh, in which new technologies uh, develop. And of course the humanities were there from, from the start with the uh, universities in, uh, in the Renaissance, with the Italian universities, the uh, Studia Humanitatis, uh, was there as one of the core subject areas. Uh, and of course, it, it, it developed with the technology, with the technology of the printing press. And now we've got challenges. We've got challenges in relation to uh, artificial intelligence. That's why we want to be able to get out to Silicon Valley at one point uh, and, and, uh, uh, and have a conference there. It's... it's changing also in terms of economy and the demands of the economy and the demands made by governments on universities. Uh, to what extent can they afford the humanities? Well, I started as a lecturer in 1974. And the, uh, just before I was starting, actually, Sir Charles Groves made a speech, uh, the great conductor. And he made a speech in which he said to governments, you neglect the arts and humanities at your peril. At your peril. Don't allow the uh, demands of the time to go into just a business case orientation uh, for universities and for education. Now here in, uh, in Oxford, in this great university, uh, may not be the pressure, perhaps, though I think Emma told me, uh, Emma Smith is speaking later, told me that they are seeing a slight pressure here. But elsewhere in the country, the applications to the humanities are declining, subjects are declining, departments are actually being closed. And also, we have this amazing thing that's occurred in which art history is no longer going to be offered as an A-level. So there are issues for us. But as somebody said to me the other day here in Oxford, uh, the humanities will stay with us. The humanities will be there because we will adapt and so what we're talking about in this conference is about how we adapt. How we adapt and how we remain absolutely relevant to that fundamental element in the humanities itself, which is the development of the individual, being at the core of university education for all these years. What is the individual about within the society in which they live? How does that society frame the individual, what does the individual contribute to the society? And it's there within the humanities. 
So I'll say more sure during during the course of the uh, course of the afternoon and, and evening. But let's go to our first lecturer. Uh, we've got two lectures this afternoon, and I'm going to invite uh, Sister Cicely Haverly, who was the head of uh, English at the Open University, uh, to introduce our first lecturer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madeline. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a very great pleasure to introduce Professor Catherine Temple from uh, Georgetown. Uh, she's taught there since 1994. And when I read her CV, I was puzzled and daunted by, with the task of introducing her adequately because it is so dazzling and so very interesting. There are a few of you here who will remember when studying literature or several other humanities subjects was really no more than one darn thing after another. My own degree was referred to sometimes as the history of literature. And so we progressed from Anglo-Saxon, not up to the present, of course, because that was so dangerous. Present literature had to go through that mysterious process which would uh, tell the good from the bad and what was going to prove durable. But it was all very predictable, and year after year, that's what happened. The subject has changed so much in the intervening years, and I'm very proud to have been part of that in a, in a small way at the Open University. Who would have thought back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s even uh, that literature and gender, literature and post-colonial studies, literature and politics, and the enormous uh, new emphasis on uh, uh, historical background, we used to call it, now it's, it, it moves alongside the, uh, the literary texts, of course. But Catherine's work takes us even further. Her, her speciality, really, is literature and the law in the 18th century. And I've been thinking about that ever since I, I, I saw the, the, the range of her papers. Let me just give you a few names, and you'll, you'll have a, 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 an inkling of, of what she does. Um, certainly, she, there's a lot of emphasis on law and the Constitution, both in the United States, amongst the Founding Fathers, because William Blackstone is a great hero of Catherine's. Um, but she ranges so much further than that, to the Gothic, to colonialism, the Lisbon earthquake, uh, Jeremy Bentham, Mary Wollstonecraft, Julia Kristeva, uh, and emotions also, the law and its relationship to emotion figures in a most impressive list of papers. Catherine's going to tell us inevitably something about her own work as well as her thoughts, uh, current work, as well as uh, her, her, her plans, her thoughts, her aspirations uh, for the future. And so with, we are, afterwards we shall have uh, we'll open the discussion to the floor, and uh, Dr. Michael Scott and I will, uh, sorry, I'm Michael Collins and I, too many Michaels here, um, will we'll, uh, uh, organize uh, what I hope will be a very interesting discussion to launch uh, this, not just uh, today's events, but this whole series of events. Without further ado, Catherine. working is it on can you hear me okay okay so um thank you for that thank you for that really lovely introduction I really appreciate it um, I also I want to thank um, Michael Scott for bringing me here um, today as well and also the president of our university Jack DeJoya who's been very hospitable to the humanities um, at Georgetown and who also is an amazingly humane and wonderful person um, some, someone I always, uh, uh, when people ask what are your role models, I can't really say that he's a role model because I can't imagine 
ever living up to the example that he um, provides us at Georgetown. Um, but I did want to take this opportunity to thank him. So um, the title of my uh, lecture today is Reinventing the Humanities. We're really big into reinventing at Georgetown. Um, and the subtitle is Enchantment, Estrangement, and Some Adjacent Possibles. Okay, so I, I hope that um, while I lead you through some of the things we've been doing at Georgetown and nationally in the US, um, and then through some of the um, sort of tools that, we, that I think will help us um, rethink the humanities um, and um, promote the humanities both within the university systems and outside the university systems. And I, I'll kind of work through that towards the end and then um, talk a bit about how we might uh, help graduate students um, navigate what's become an increasingly um, difficult terrain. Okay, so, um, and, I, and I also just want to say this PowerPoint is very print heavy. I've developed it as a tool for faculty and students to use. So should you um, like to have me send it to you, I'm really happy to do that and just see me after the lecture and I'll send the PowerPoint out. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of funny, I'm uh, staying at what might be an appropriately titled place on Folly Court. <laughs> and um, my landlord of what has turned out to be an illegally rented Airbnb um, <laughs> uh, was chatting with me yesterday and asking me what I was doing. And I said, well, um, I'm reinventing graduate education in the humanities. And he said, um, well, what is the problem that that project is supposed to address? Right? Which I thought was the, that is the question, right? Um, the question, why do we want to do this? Why are we working on this? Um, and I immediately gave him the PowerPoint and the lecture, but no, not really. I <laughs> told him in a couple minutes what we were trying to do. But I just want to start with this idea of um, quit lit. Have you heard of quit lit? Okay, quit lit is this very um, disturbing genre that has um, come across mostly through blogging and um, Chronicle of Higher Education and other educational publications. Students in the humanities, graduate students, who get almost all the way through their degree or actually through their degree and then are unable to find employment, suitable employment in the academy, right? And they've developed this genre called quit lit where they bemoan their education. Any grad students nodding here? I see some. Um, you know, where they, <laughs> um, they bemoan the entire fact of their education. I was talking to one a couple weeks ago who was talking about her entire seven years as an utter waste of time. Why had she made such a terrible mistake? There was nothing she could do with her degree in music, right, and et cetera. So, you know, one place you might want to look for this is Erin Bartram. She has 80,000 views. Right, and it's a, it's a very sad disenchantment story about the grief she felt at finally leaving um, academia and leaving the dream of academic employment to go out into the world. And I think, you know, it's, it's that that we're trying to address. You know, it's that sort of human pain that we're trying to um, find a solution for, okay? So, you know, when I think about like, why did students end up like this? You know, I wonder, I think, I think the tendency has been among faculty to blame the students. Don't the students read the papers? Don't they know the employment figures are, I'm getting more nods back here. Don't you know the employment figures um, are terrible for academic employment? They should know this. They're intelligent people. What's wrong with them? Um, another narrative I've heard is kind of an exceptionalist rhetoric where it's assumed that students who get that upset when they can't find academic employment have been operating under the belief that they're so exceptional that they'll be the one exception to the rule, right? So that doesn't seem like a satisfying explanation to me. Um, I do know that students get to that point not because they don't have the information. They have the information, all right? So if you look at the data, and again, happy to send the PowerPoint, um, it's about 50% in the U.S. of um, humanities PhDs who end up employed in academia in some way, right? Um, again, the, 50 the right over 50% figure um, occurs everywhere, okay? If you look at this, the blue is academic employment. As you move over into the brown areas, it's non-academic employment, right? So. The two points here, one is that the data is out there. There's only about half of a chance that people are 50% of a chance that people are going to end up 
employed in academia, but the data is also out there that they almost all end up employed. This barista myth that they're all working at Starbucks, that's just a myth. These folks do get wonderful jobs, right? And I talk to the people who have PhDs in humanities all the time who just love what they're doing, right? Now, it may take them a little while to get there, but they end up in very good places, all right? Um, so it's not that they can't get the jobs. It's not that nobody's telling them. I don't think it's because they are uh, narcissistic exceptionalists. Um, I don't think it's because they're not intelligent. I don't think it's because they're not reading the um, papers. I think there are a couple of things that contribute to it. Um, maybe it's the faculty's fault. This is another theory that we hear, right? That the faculty, at, especially at R1 institutions where most of our students get their PhDs, represent this idealized end, right? And they don't do anything to undermine the student's belief that they're going to end up in that position. And you do see this. I mean, you do see faculty encouraging students to go, um, say, for a PhD in English, telling them you're going to be the one who will get a tenure-line job in English. Um, I th you know, one of the things that people don't talk about, though, is it's stu the students don't just want a tenure-line job. They want a tenure-line job at an R1 institution, right? And those jobs are sp very, very, very few and far between, right? Um, so they end up disappointed if they're in a job at a non R1 institution or a non-elite liberal arts college, and then they end up even more disappointed if they're not in any academic employment at all. Okay, here's here's what I think causes the problem. I don't think again it's these the individuals doing these evil things or the students being uh, weak people, for instance. That's one of the things I've heard. Um, it's that we reinforce unrealistic expecta expectations through structure, right? That structurally our programs are all developed towards one end, and that one end is the R1 tenure line position. Structurally, we do not prepare students for non-R1 positions, and we don't prepare students for anything outside the academy. So no matter what, this is like what they say in AA, do you talk the talk or walk the walk, right? No matter what we say to the students, as long as we're walking the walk, structurally of preparing them only for R1 positions, that's what they're going to come to believe they deserve at the end of the degree program. So what we need to start doing and what we've been kind of working on at Georgetown and nationally um, is rethinking how we structure not only graduate education but undergraduate education. Because, I, you know, I think um, there, there are things that we're not doing. We're not um, preparing students to articulate the value of the humanities. We're not preparing them to articulate the kind, the ways of thinking and the um, sort of the habits of thought and the skills, two different things that they develop in the humanities. And there's changes all down the line um, from undergrad education through the PhD that can help us um, shift the balance here. Um, we have to change the structure to change expectations. Right, both locally within programs and in the outside world. So I'm just going to give a little history of what we've been doing at um, Georgetown. I got into this business um, very, very curiously. Uh, I was chairing the English department at Georgetown, and we did not have a PhD in English. We've had a master's degree forever. Um, periodically, we go through a cycle where we decide we need to have a PhD, um, that it's uh, institutionally valuable for Georgetown and for our department to have a PhD. So I had cycled through that right when I got to Georgetown in the um, mid-90s. And then as chair, my second term, thank God there are only two terms and <laughs> that are allowed <laughs> at Georgetown. Um, the second term, I decided to approach this again. Um, we had a wonderful committee of creative thinkers, and they immediately said, we can't pr propose a traditional PhD in English. There's no room for that. Nobody's going to support it. There's no positions for these students coming out. We're going to propose a non-traditional alternative PhD program. And it's going to have four poles. It's going to have alternatives to the standard dissertation. Right, shocker, right? Um, it's going to be short time to degree, because one of the big complaints is students taking eight to 10 years to degree. And we were going to manage that through requiring students to come in with an MA and a project in hand. Um, it, it was going to be interdisciplinary in one way or another. Right, And then um, the fourth part was really considered very radical. Students would do an internship or residency in some position, 
it could be an academic position, but not a teaching position. So pre preferably outside the academy, in public agencies, in government, even in business, right? Something outside the academy that brought their humanities training to some kind of public facing enterprise. So those were the four poles. So I got that through the department, just squeaked through. There was um, surprising to me because I was a lawyer before I did this, so it seemed like, it didn't really seem that radical to me, but there was a lot of opposition, okay? And the opposition came from different quarters. One um, point was, this is not what the humanities is for. The humanities is only for its intrinsic value, pragmatic value, utilitarian value, no, we don't do that. Um, one, uh, one concern was, we don't have the training to do this. We are only trained to create what we call in this business little, you know, mini-me's. We're only um, trained to create people who are like us. And there were, there were a number of other objections from different quarters. Um, so, but I did get it squeaked through the department. We were moving forward, and then at the um, university level, they got very worried about the sustainability of it financially. Okay, so we slowed down. Right at that, at that moment, there was an article in the Chronicle from the Modern Language Association. They had done a big study of graduate education in the humanities, and they had come out with four or five uh, recommendations for the future, and surprise, surprise, those five things mapped onto our program. And with that, so we had been working in our usual little silos and hadn't even realized it. Um, they, their um, program was covered in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there were a lot of attacks on it in, in the media um, along the same lines that we had experienced at Georgetown, same kind of um, lines of controversy. So I just wrote the um, person who was running that committee and said, just want to let you know we are doing the same thing here at Georgetown. Here's our proposal um, and um, you know, want to offer my support. So the next day, the Modern Language Association called me and said, do you want to write a proposal for a grant from the Mellon Foundation? So we, t together, it was, I wrote the Georgetown part, we um, wrote a proposal to the Mellon Foundation and it was a two, two and a half million dollar grant was the um, response. And so the people working on this in the states are the Modern Language Association, Georgetown, Arizona State University, which um, some people know, many don't know, is probably the most innovative state university in the country, right? And the Irvine Research Institute. Um, and we've all approached it from lots of different ways, and I'm going to show you what some of those ways are. So, and all, all of this is about changing the structure, right, shifting the structure. So, you know, I, I used the expression the adjacent possible in my title, and this is super print heavy, so I'll skip this slide, but there it is for you. This comes from Stuart Kaufman. He's a theoretical biologist who's interested in evolution, natural selection, and structuralism. And his question is always, how does change occur without destroying the structure it inhabits? All right. And his theory is that there is this arena he calls the adjacent possible, which is the nearest next possible change. And that biospheres are, you know, this has been taken up in business and in, um, upper, in um, higher ed, um, that systems change um, in ways that increase the diversity of what can happen next. They explore the adjacent possible as fast as they can get away with it, okay, that's Kaufman speaking, without destroying their own internal organization. So this has become a very popular idea, and I think it's a really good way to think about change, because change in this area is going to be incremental, right? It's going to be slow, but I have seen it happening over the last 10 years. Okay, so when I started in this, there was always massive opposition from faculty and graduate students alike. And now when I present on this at conferences, most of the people there are because they're interested in working on change at their own institution. Okay, not that there is an opposition, but there has been a shift in the sort of tenor of that. So just to show you some of the adjacent possibles, I'm going to show you a few slides from the Grant Institute that we held at Georgetown in September. Right, we always do a lot of stuff with whiteboards at Georgetown, design thinking. Um, here was ASU's slide, right? We've tried to kind of map everything that we have been doing. Um, the key word for them is wellness. They've been working on wellness programs for graduate students. Um, here is our slide, and this is a little scary because I wrote this slide. 
And what I realized is we've just been doing so many different things all over the place for the last three years. All kinds of um, talks for graduate students, bringing in alumni, bringing in um, experts on the job market, um, theory talks, just every, everything that you can imagine. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that you can do um, that we have already tried. Um, here's um, University of California Humanities Research Institute, and they were very focused on taking what they were already doing with graduate students on a statewide basis, so they present a slightly more organized um, slate of activities. And here's the Modern Language Association. They've been doing things both nationally at their conferences and locally in New York City with, with graduate students, um, introducing them to the possibility of diverse employment um, outside the academy. So all those slides, all that stuff came down to these three words, basically. Structure, culture, and agency, right? And what I'm gonna focus on here is structure, obviously. Um, because structure changes the culture, change culture. Um, it all works in kind of feedback loop that will change um, agency, both for graduate students, faculty, and even for um, institutions. Um, no restructuring, no joy, and that's something I'm borrowing from Stacy Hartman who talks about joy and wellness for grad students. So when I think about a change, trying to change something can be incredibly discouraging, right, as many people, including you, know in this room. Um, and you have to really think about it incrementally, and you also have to realize it's going to come from, unless you're working from many different directions, I think that's why my slide is so crazy and all over the place. I like to work from lots of different directions. So you've got to work from top down, bottom up, and sort of what I call a slant, right? So if you're, if you're an administrator, some of the things um, you know, we need to think about are having open conversations with deans and provosts and other higher level administrators about how programs are evaluated, right? And I, this comes from faculty every time I give this talk. We need to talk about this with administrators. We need to talk about the way that faculty are evaluated. Right, as well as programs, because faculty can't be free to change things if they are only being evaluated on their research platform, the, serve, the, you know, the three key things in the US, research, service, and teaching, with research being a heavy, really 50 to 75% of the evaluative move. Okay, so I, I, I found that, um, I guess you might call it managing up to deans and administrators is a very important part of our project because many, many of our deans are in the sciences. I had a dean who didn't know what the phrase public humanities meant, right? Um, I have had deans who really thought that the only value of the humanities was intrinsic. So, you know, and, and this has just changed over time as we've been um, pushing this project ahead. And I, but I think it's a problem at a lot of institutions and it's something that we can do. Um, Working from above for the faculty, I think this means relentless faculty development. This is where the Mellon Foundation, it's probably I should be thanking them. I know I should be thanking them. They've been very important because they've given us resources to do this. Okay, so encouraging faculty to rethink their courses, rethink their advising, rethink their mentoring. Um, be sure that they um, encourage diversity and career choice for students both undergrad students and graduate students. Encourage them to imagine students as trained in knowledge production rather than in content. This is a huge shift, right? And it's worth an entire chapter of a book somewhere. But the more that we think of students as only invested in content, the less employable they are outside the academy. All right, and really what we're training them in is habits of thought, ways of working, times of research. Um, the idea of knowledge production is central to their lives, which is something that's valuable everywhere. Um, we, we need to revise all aspects of the curriculum, undergrad and grad. And I'm just, you know, to get back to the um, question of emotion and sadness, um, for undergrads, I feel especially concerned that we need to work with them so they can articulate what they're doing in their humanities courses. We tried to do a video series last year with some of our very smart undergrads talking with them, getting them on video about, asking them about how their humanities work in their courses was going to contribute to their future. And we gave up after about four or five students because the responses, they were bewildered. They didn't know how to talk about the humanities. They, didn't, they couldn't make the connection between courses in English or courses in, say, Italian literature and the humanities. And they couldn't talk 
about the habits of mind or the skills that they had developed outside the usual critical thinking, better writing skills, things like that. And I actually, we had actually had one student cry on the video because she just could not answer the question. Okay, so we stopped doing that because we felt that that was a failure of the institution, right? Not a failure of the students. Um, we need to, you know, go all the way to the point of revising application processes and looking at broader impacts, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, curriculum reform, undergrad courses, we can work with a toolbox. We've been working on a kind of toolbox for um, undergrad um, professors to present to their students maybe first couple of classes so that they kind of frame what they're doing. We need to rethink our course selections, both for undergrads, but especially grad students, PhD students, we, we think about um, coverage, wanting them to know a large field, right? That's what we call the upholstery model sometimes. We need to think more in terms of tailoring curriculum to particular students. And especially for PhD students, when you might only have 10 students coming in each year, it really seems to be no obstacle to, um, well, there are many obstacles, but no rational obstacle to tailoring curriculum to their needs. We need to rethink orals and comps, and I think this is what I like to call low-hanging fruit to when we um, devise the requirements for orals and comps. We can include a public-facing or engagement com component, ask them to think about what's the broader impact of their work. And I, I, if you're from the U.S., the um, broader impact language comes from sciences. The National Science Foundation requires every um, grant um, applicant to describe the broader impact of their work. So it's not a new idea, and it's not an a, um, outlandish thing um, to think about that public money going towards education might be interested in broader impacts. Um, some of this is related um, largely to graduate um, programs, but I think both undergrad and grad programs, we need to think about these, um, the idea of pro seminars that go to the big issues of the value of the humanities and what it means to do work in the humanities and how we can articulate that. We also we need to consider alternatives to the dissertation. And some of those might be radical alternatives. Um, generally, when I've discussed this in groups, there are people who start out very enthusiastic, and then the more they think about it, the more they are reluctant to give up the traditional dissertation. The more they feel that the tradition, and now I'm seeing a lot of nods, the traditional dissertation um, teaches some rigorous habits of thought, and we don't really want to lose that. So I think that's kind of a tough question. But one thing we can do with the dissertation is to suggest that it has some kind of public-facing aspect or broader impacts language, right? Um, working from below, I'm starting to really hate this metaphor, the spatial metaphor, but I do think it's important to realize that grad students themselves can exert a lot of pressure, right, on the system, okay? And they're now coming in demanding um, some career development workshops from day one, better advising and better mentoring. You know, and what's interesting about the better mentoring and the mentoring towards a more diverse set of career options is what we found is that when we do that, the students are also much better prepared for um, academic um, job markets. Right, so over and over again, we bring students into these programs, we prepare them for these public-facing positions, and they're on the job market, the academic job market, and they're on the alternative job market, and surprise, they get an academic tenure-line job after maybe years of not being able to get one. So um, I think in some ways, we're not preparing students very well for either the academic job market or the, um, uh, the alternative job market. Um, there's one thing that we can do that I think is low-hanging fruit. It's so easy. Um, site visits for students to people with PhDs in the humanities who are working outside the academy. We did this last um, summer at Georgetown, took students over to Folger Shakespeare Library, Library of Congress, and then a Catholic think tank called Center of Concern, and had them just gave them the opportunity to talk with people who had made that transition, and it was eye-opening. And the students were amazed. They went in there thinking that anyone who hadn't gotten an R1 tenure line job was going to be miserable and hate their job. And instead, they found again and again and again that people working in those positions were very excited about their work, were really happy that they were doing it. And then a number of them had left tenure line jobs 
in order to, for instance, work with the Folger, or work with the Library of Congress, or work with Center of Concern. Okay, so that was eye-opening to the students. That's, that's a way of creating hope in students who are terrified of the job market and miserable about their prospects. It really changes um, the mood in the um, figurative room. Working a slant is one of my favorite ways to work. Um, I, I think we, we just need to publicize much more of what's already happening. Right? If you go to most English department or humanities department's websites, there's no mention of some of these other alternative programming, the kind of program that's going on. So that's like a very easy, low-hanging fruit. Um, we need to bring alums to campus to talk about their careers. We need to do the site visits. Um, we need to encourage grad students to develop multiple audiences. University of Delaware has an amazing summer program for graduate students. It's not an alt-act type program. It's just simply about helping them articulate the value of the, their work they're doing in their dissertations to a larger public in lots of different venues. Um, we can do a lot more of that. Um, humanity centers and organizations, they tend to be very divorced from the academy. I mean, we have the National Humanities Alliance and um, National Endowment for the Humanities um, in DC, and I don't think um, they've ever really been to campus. Right, maybe occasionally a representative, but there's no real interaction there. That's that's an un, you know, that is low hanging fruit that we should be plucking. Um, Stacy Hartman, just to go to the bottom of the slide, her work on joy and wellness suggests that adding wellness programming um, can really make a big difference. The students are so anxious and so depressed about the job market, right, and they mostly are not going to talk to faculty about that um, unless and sometimes in certain arenas they will, but they mostly are not. Um, and it sounds very kind of woo-woo to me, right? I'm kind of a pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get in there and do your work kind of person. But when we've worked with the grad students around this issue, we found that they're relieved and you know they're very engaged in this. People do not do their best work when they're um, over anxious, depressed and upset. Right? They need to have um, stimulation, they need to have maybe a little bit of anxiety, but they don't do their best work when they're overwhelmed with it. So we need to work much harder to help students um, manage the emotions around the contingent job market. Right? I'm, Helen Small is in the back of the room, right? So I hope she <laughs> doesn't mind that I've reduced her wonderful book, The Value of the Humanities, to these five points. But I do this here because so many of us are working in um, other fields and don't really have the time or the energy to focus on the humanities or on um, advocating for the humanities. So I'm trying to give people like a little thumbnail sketch of what might be out there. Um, Helen's argument for the humanities is really the most um, interesting and complex that I've run across in the last five years. And I'm just summarizing it from her own summary here. So, you know, what do the humanities do? We study the meaning-making practices of the culture, focus on interpretation and evaluation, and then there's this indispensable element of subjectivity, okay? And I think that's so interesting because that really kind of uh, gets at some of the differences between the objectives, for instance, of the sciences and the social sciences and the, and the objectives of the humanities. Um, we put pressure on how governments understand use, right? So it's, it's not that we have all the answers, it's not that our understanding of how the world ought to work or how human beings ought to behave is the only one, but it puts pressures on other types of understandings. Um, we contribute to happiness, and I think Helen said the last time um, I heard her speak that this chapter on happiness was the one that she had the most doubts about, um, but I think it's actually a very, very convincing argument. It's not so much that we contribute to individual happiness, which I hope that we do, right? But to how we understand happiness and what it means to be happy as a human being. Right? We offer informed views on social and communal life. This is the democracy needs us argument, okay? And it's a kind of problematic argument, maybe, but living in the States right now, <laughs> I have no problems believing it. We have failed our students at every level from um, public education, college, and graduate school if they can't be good citizens, right, and understand civility in civil, civic life. Um, 
intrinsic value, right? <laughs> the idea, but I, th I think um, Helen has a really interesting um, take on intrinsic value, right? That goes way beyond what people were telling me when they were opposing our PhD program. The idea that humanities think, that our habits of thought are a necessary corrective to an economically driven culture. Okay, so it's not so much this kind of objective um, binary between intrinsic value and pragmatic value as it is a slightly different way of seeing the world. Okay, so that gives you a, a little bit of the theory behind what you, you know, you, the arguments that you might bring up for the value of the humanities. I also want to give you um, what I've been thinking about in terms of the habits of mind, the PhDs in the humanities, but that all sort of robust thinkers in the humanities develop over time. Again, and again, this is because we've tended to um, offer some stereotyped answers to the question, like what, what are the transferable skills? The talk tends to be around skills. What are the transferable skills that advanced students in the humanities have? And you see those at the very bottom of the slide. These are the things that are always raised, critical thinking, research skills, communication skills, um, possibly, this is where it gets a little dodgy, greater empathy or the ability to inhabit alternative viewpoints, right? And we were talking about that before the lecture. But you, you have to think, who are the people who read the most literature in the world? They're in English departments, okay? Um, English departments would be the most humane places in the world if the empathy argument was true. So, um, so you know, so the empathy thing, I don't know. But, but these, these are the standard um, sort of um, cliched responses um, that we do see. So, so when we, we try to think about this in a slightly more complex way and really think about, you know, like how, do, how do these students, how are they different? at the end of advanced um, study in the humanities. Well, they, they develop a comfort with intellectual and emotional difficulty. I think a robust PhD program especially is expert at helping students develop that. They have a value for both disciplinary work, the deep dive, right, and interdisciplinary expertise, right? Um, they have a sensitivity to history and the way it shapes the present. Right? And I think that uh, um, does uh, distinguish the humanities from many other fields. We were talking about economics during the lunch break. Right? Um, I think you know, law is my own good example of that. There's very little um, treatment of legal history in law schools. Right? So this importance of history and always seeing history as influencing the present, I think is very important to the way we think. Um, a sensitivity to the relationship between form and content. And that form content connection, that's a threshold concept for humanities undergrads. Many of them never quite get there, right? But once they get there, um, that is the sort of magic tool for humanities folks. The ability to come to conclusions in ambiguous and confusing contexts. Um, it makes, makes me think of the uh, TV show, uh, The Good Place, if anybody's been watching that. The critique there of philosophy is that philosophers can't ever come to decisions. <laughs> and thus they end up going to hell, right? Uh, but, but we do try to teach students, and especially through the dissertation, to come to some conclusions in these ambiguous, confusing contexts. The management of multiple levels of discourse, different registers, multiple theoretical paradigms, and I would argue that we, you know, we need to be teaching both the ability to speak to specialized audience and to public audiences outside the academy. Curiosity, I'm always asking, how can this be complicated? What are we missing here? How can we anticipate the unanticipated, right? And that goes along with the next one, which is the ability to see received truths as maybes and to suggest alternatives. And then um, they have the ability to evaluate methodologies and denaturalize them, also related to, you know, using them when appropriate. Seeing method not as a truth so much, but as something that is used in appropriate context to reach particular results. Um, and the, then the usual things that we talked about at the beginning. You can see once you get away from the stereotypical ideas about what we're teaching in the humanities, there's a kind of richness there that isn't often articulated, right? And that we need to do better. We need to do better at articulating it. So some things that we can tell graduate students, right? Um, where can they find some positions? And again, this is where the PowerPoint might be useful to some of you who are mentoring graduate students. 
Um, I often get the question, well, why would somebody out in business want to hire a PhD in English, for instance? Well, here's a long list of places that are hiring people like that. Um, and I could have listed 50 more organizations. Um, students are always asking how they, can they prepare themselves for these kind of positions. And I think grad students especially often feel overworked as it is and don't want to add anything extra on. But what I've seen is that the hope and the optimism that they develop um, from becoming aware that there are diverse opportunities for them and that the R1 position is not the only thing that could make them happy after graduation gives them the kind of energy to pursue um, some of these activities. So they can do things like um, get involved with state and local humanities group, take or audit a class in nonprofit management, work on a LinkedIn profile, all these pragmatic stuff that students in the business world do as, as a matter of routine, but our humanities students do not do. Right? They can be advised to do these. Um, we can offer them you know, site visits, um, practice of, um, applying for different jobs. They can take grant writing workshops, anything that encourages them to think about their work as leading to more than just one particular end. Um, I think one of the um, easier fixes that a graduate student actually recommended at the last conference I was at was adding a digital humanity slant or a broader impact slant to a dissertation. Right? And most, most faculties would accept that at this point. That made that person marketable, and she's in an ed educational technology firm, which it was her preference over a tenure line position. So, you know, I'm, I'm partly here because they're, they're, uh, this is mission driven, right? Um, the idea of getting students better jobs is, you know, that's a wonderful idea, and I'm very committed to it. We tend to focus on that kind of expansion of the job market, and that's really a great thing, right? Um, but there's a lot more that um, is behind the, um, the sort of commitment I have to the project. If we get students out into the world beyond the academy, then we make the most of these valuable resources. I think it is terribly sad we have these brilliant, brilliant students right, who end up trapped in recurring sets of low-paid part-time academic employment rather than getting out in the world and using their skills and their habits of mind to do something amazing. They have that ability, and we're not giving them the tools to make full use of it. Um, if we encourage students to think about post-PhD or post-MA or even post-undergraduate in terms of diverse employment, we counter the argument the humanities program should be reduced in size or eliminated, right? And, I th and Michael was talking about that a little bit in his introductory remarks. This is what I hear most often. The answer to the employment crisis is to cut humanities programs, right? And I, I have to say, I love Obama, but when he said that art history students um, should not be pursuing those degrees, I was so disappointed in him, right? They should be pursuing those degrees. If we cut programs, we're going to reduce the diversity of the students who can come into them, right? Think about it this way. If Harvard accepts only five or six PhD students a year and they cut it to two, who are those two going to be? They're not going to represent diversity. You know, they're not, they're not going to represent a full range of American culture. They're going to be very wealthy, top 1% white students. Right. So we are going to make our PhD programs even less diverse, and through that, make all of higher education even less diverse. Um, we have to encourage non-traditional students to pursue degrees at every level, the, the bachelor's degree, the MA, the PhD. And the only way to do that is to assure them that there are divor diverse employment possibilities after graduation because they are terrified of, in the U.S., student loans. And I hear that here this has become a bigger problem as well recently. But in the U.S., for an undergraduate student in the humanities to graduate with $100,000 in student loans, right, and feeling that there's no prospects of employment that will ever allow that to be repaid, that drives um, all but the most elite um, higher income students out of the profession. Um, this, this, to me, is the Jesuit mission, right? It's humanities-oriented, it's education-oriented, and it's taking education from the cloister out into the world, okay? Um, it believes in diversity, right? And it, belie it believes in increasing opportunities for education for everyone. Um, so those are some of the purposes um, that drive the mission.
right? And that I hope would drive the mission for everyone. So just to get and maybe end with the uh, Jason Possibles, you know, the idea of um, picking the low-hanging fruit, right? There's low-hanging fruit that we can all pick, whether we're a graduate student, even an undergraduate, I don't know if there are any undergrads in the audience, um, faculty or administrators. Um, we can change instruction in undergrad courses. We can think about public-facing projects. We can even make slight changes to requirements, such as adding the um, broader impacts language to applications and orals and comps and dissertations. That is not a huge controversial change. And then we have to build ladders to reach the fruit at the top, right? And the fruit at the top would be a broad acceptance of diverse career tracks for humanities students and a broad acceptance of non-instrumental humanities approaches to global and local problems. Um, so, so that's where I hope we're aiming. That's our aim, right? And, um, and that certainly has been my goal through this entire project. Thank you. Shall I claim the privilege of sitting here to ask the first question? Okay. <laughs> uh, there, were, there were lots of things I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, you, you take a bit further, but, um, uh, and I won't go into details. The one that reflected my own experience most closely was your recommendation that f uh, faculty uh, needed to uh, rethink um, their uh, priorities. Um, and getting, uh, well, frankly, more respect for teaching. And then teaching the teachers how to teach these things that will result in this kind of uh, broader uh, outcome uh, from advanced study. That seems to me the key to what is a very optimistic vision, and, but not an unrealistic one, providing we can put the, the pieces in place and get that key change effected. So, how do you, yes, how do you teach the teachers to, to... Oh, okay, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's a very difficult question, right, and hard to approach, because faculty are already overworked. Um, I think it might be a little worse here than it is in the U.S., depending on what institution you're at, but all we hear about are outcomes and performance reviews and um, the kinds of things that put pressure on us to produce mostly research and to place less emphasis on teaching and certainly not very much emphasis at all on this administrative work. Um, what we've done at Georgetown, um, we, we find that throwing money at the problem is <laughs> very helpful and that's where the Mellon, <laughs> Mellon Foundation came in. Um, we ran um, workshops and uh, colloquia for faculty who were interested in revising their courses along these lines, taking students out um, of the academic community, um, working on public facing projects. And you know, we um, stipended them to get involved with this. And part of the stipend was in that they would teach the course that they had developed, right? And that, I mean, it, it's something you have to do across the long term because you're only gonna draw a small percentage of faculty each time. Right? But then those faculty go back into their departments and they often become sort of missionaries for this approach. So it does a little bit more than it might seem to just on the surface. Um, does that help? Yeah. I, th I think into the other issue there that faculty will always bring up is I would love to do these things if my institution would compensate me for them or reward me for them. Right? So that's where working with administrators comes on comes in and changing even the departmental culture to um, reward faculty for doing something other than what they have traditionally been rewarded for. Yeah. Thanks, yes. Yeah, I sense. There's a lady up there. Do we have a microphone, by the way? Yep. Uh, you're talking about wellness. Oh, uh, the wellness project. Um, humanities, you can't have a good physics department if you don't have a good English department. And I think this is 
well known to everybody who ever worked in a work in a place of knowledge and and to um, degrade or downgrade sorry um, learning literature or art history to wellness I think it's against what we want to achieve and if Obama really said that we're in big trouble and you can hear it here so the government is cutting down on what they call soft subjects mm -hmm. and then we hear that the BBC is a soft power it's very important mm -hmm. so if anything humanities is our way to deal with the language we use to recognize this world not very different to to what they do in, in physics or chemistry having said that I know several people who um, graduated with a lovely PhD in chemistry and went to work in IT because there was nothing for them to do. So this is a cross-subject problem, I think. How do we deal with that? But surely, first and foremost, our problem with humanities and the way they are perceived mm -hmm. as something that is not maybe that important in a world where corporate values are at, at, at the top. And I don't think we, sh I think we should be more ambitious and put corporate world on one side and said, no, what's right for you is not what's right for humanities and we need more money. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately the Mellon uh, Foundation has heard that argument and responded. Yeah, um, Let's see. Well, you know, the war between the humanities and the sciences seems to me a waste of time, right? And you see it at every level. You see it at the departmental level. You see it at the university level. You see it nationally, culturally. Um, interdisciplinarity, I think, is, you know, this, this is what's happening now and what's going to happen more and more in the future. One of the things that we're very interested in is bringing the humanities to bear on global and local problems. So our graduate school has developed a number of programs, um, global infectious disease, for instance, that's drawing on some humanities approaches. Um, I, I, I mean, it's great to demand more money from a culture that doesn't want to give it to you, right? Um, I think that's certainly one approach. And I, but I think, you know, it's obvious from the presentation that I believe in approaching these kinds of problems from a number of different perspectives, and that would only be one of them. You know, change seems to me to ha happen somewhat incrementally. Um, I don't know if that responds to your queries. I did want to say one thing about the wellness, because I kind of threw that in there. Um, I think it's an intriguing um, idea. Well, we have lots of wellness programs for undergrads in the U.S. and most institutions. There's counseling center and all kinds of stress reduction workshops and things like that. But very few for graduate students. And what, that's the sciences and the humanities, right? And so, you know, arguing for that for graduate students is, is a somewhat radical um, position to take. And that's, that's the position the Modern Language Association is taking. It's not reducing... Um, humanities education to wellness, it's offering it as an adjunct to their education to help them be more effective. Yeah. Thank you. Question down here at the front. Yeah. Uh, That's you. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm curious about mature students. Uh, can they come in to get a PhD without any particular desire for mm -hmm. It's, those students are not typical of an R1 graduate program. Um, that, you know, we do have a, a program at Georgetown, a, a doctorate in liberal studies that appeals to those students. But I think they're a great resource, right? And they are, they already see the value of the humanities. That's why they're working on the degree, right? And they in Washington, it's amazing. I mean, every time we look at one of those entering classes. I feel um, awed by the experience and expertise that they bring. So couldn't there be some space to, you know, bring them a little closer into the, the research? And, you know, I mean, if you, you're trying to 
trying to make it more closer to the world if you put these people in, a, in, a, in an isolated uh I, I would love to have them in the traditional programs, yeah. But I'm sure you all know if you've ever worked on a PhD admissions committee, you know, everyone's looking for the next rising, and this is ageist, young star, right? Yeah. I, I was involved in Georgetown with the establishment of the Doctor of Liberal Studies. Uh, it was impossible, it really difficult to finally get it approved uh, for the very reason Kathy says. It's not a real doctoral degree, or at least so it was perceived. Uh, and there were a number of arguments, one of which, of course, is PhD means study uh, uh, deeply in one area, and this is a more more broad-reaching broad kind of program where there's an effort to integrate things to, uh, interdisciplinarily and so on. I, I could go on with the litany of reasons why it's not real, but um, it's a very difficult thing to, to achieve, and then it becomes quarantined from the real graduate school. Right. Well, and I think if we want to think structurally, you know, I think the most sort of amusing argument against the kind of work that we've been doing is that we're turning the PhD in the humanities into a pre-professional degree. Well, it is a pre-professional degree, right? It's always been there to produce professional academics, right? And that's one reason that these programs tend to not accept students who, who then go into the liberal studies on doctoral program because they're trying to prepare students for the professions. All we're suggesting is that we prepare students for more than just one profession that only has about 10 jobs in the U.S. available a year. Uh, back there, please. Yes. <clears throat> I wonder if there's a difference there between the UK and the US, actually. Awesome. I wanted to ask you about structure and expectations in the disillusioned graduate student, because uh, in the 1980s, it was perfectly possible for a British graduate student to get British Academy funding uh, because they wanted to spend three years extending their mind, extending their thinking, mm -hmm. doing all the things that you're arguing that we now need to remind people a humanities PhD can do. Now, you cannot fill in an AHRC reference form for a student without ticking a box saying, does this MA student, prospective MA student, want to do a PhD? And if it's for a PhD grant, does this PhD prospective applicant want to have an academic position? So the culture we need to change is the funding culture, mm -hmm. because then students will not be going into PhDs thinking that it is only a pre-professional qualification. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of that in the um, UK system. It, it's all in the US, these have always been as long as I've been involved and much earlier. My, my father got a PhD and it was purely to prepare him for the academy, right? And it, that's what it's been like in the US. There really hasn't been a, maybe a, an occasional student who wanted to get a PhD, maybe independently wealthy student, right? Who wanted to do it for um, self-actualization but generally they've been pre-professional degrees. Two people here. The gentleman in the, there, yes. Thank you. Is it turned on? It's on. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I wonder if um, during your various seminars that you've put together in the United States, if you've looked at a macro level of the problem, because what you're presenting is really the internal view of the uh, of the humanities graduate student and graduate professors. But if we stepped one up, the question of what the power elite represents today and what kind of education is uh, expected in the power elite, we find that that maps very well onto the change of the power elites over the last 50 years. So when 10% of the population was going to university in the 1960s, the English departments in many universities were, with history, represented 60% of the teaching. But that's because the power elites were reproducing themselves in one way. Mm -hmm. The power elites today are not interested in that at all. So we've got a problem at the problem at the social level of the social demand. 
for this type of education. And secondly, I would just point out that what you explained as an advantage, the various skills, could be actually said of um, economics, could be Absolutely. said of science, uh -huh. of neuroscience today yeah. is very well mapped onto that. Uh -huh. So the exclusivity argument is diminished by the fact that it can be done elsewhere. And I think also it'll be interesting to hear later on if there's an engagement with the Silicon Valley people, particularly in the artificial intelligence community, which I've had a lot of experience with, they are going to be very hard on this approach of what is going to be built into the new systems. Mm -hmm. So I think this macro level is in many ways conditioning the crisis. So interesting. I, looking at this historically, well, I, first I want to just um, <laughs> clarify that, you know, listing the habits of mind of the humanities, I'm not suggesting that these are unique to the humanities, but I am suggesting that they are habits of mind that we produce and they have value and we need to claim that value. So, you know, certainly there are other fields that, you know, develop the same, similar or, but usually with a slightly different inflection. Um, habits of mind or skills, so there's that. But historically, I thought it was so interesting to read about, you know, the history of college education in the U.S., that in the 40s and 50s, most businesses didn't want to hire college-educated people. They didn't think that those people had the skills that they needed. And then with the growth of middle management especially, they started realizing that college-educated students had skills, partly through having to deal with the bureaucracy of having gone to college. Right, um, that they had the skills that they needed. They had more complex ways of thinking that were really useful in business. And that's you know then after the World War II, with the um, GI Bill, we expanded education opportunities um, greatly. Right. So, what I've been thinking about lately, when I, especially when we went around Washington and visited these sites, the the PhD in the humanities in DC is held in very high regard, and students asked repeatedly. Um, they asked these people who were PhDs employed outside the academy, should I even finish my PhD? Is it worth it? Right? You're doing the work that doesn't seem to have much to do with medieval architecture or whatever you studied in your PhD. And I, I would hold my breath because I was afraid folks were going to say, no, the PhD isn't worth it. You shouldn't do it. And I'd actually be in a program advocating that our students drop out of the PhDs they were pursuing. So holding my breath must have worked because every place we went, the people employed in these agencies and these alternative positions said the PhD is, actual, is absolutely worth it. It is a ticket to getting into higher impact positions in DC. Now, I don't think that's true across the entire country, right? But I think it's very true on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Silicon Valley is an interesting um, example because, of course, Steve Jobs was a big humanities advocate. Um, and I, I don't know, that's a very mixed picture between people who are completely embedded in the sciences and people who can see the value of humanities thinking, especially for artificial intelligence, but also for what they're now calling the end of work. You realize work is going to end and we're not gonna know what to do with ourselves, <laughs> right? And this is a problem that Silicon Valley is thinking about, right? There was somebody else, yes. yes. It would be fair to say uh, that um, the elephant in the room still remains the marketability and the financing of uh, humanities in a world that seems to be uh, um, drifting away from uh, a recognition of their independent value. Now, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, several categories of change. One of them, and uh, an important one is also the change of uh, sources of uh, um, funding to universities. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that uh, still in the United States there is uh, immense importance, an uh, important role that uh, local uh, magnates, local uh, um, corporate organizations play as potential donors or active donors. Mm -hmm. But there is, uh, surely, surely you would recognize the change 
uh, that is um, um, embodied in the role that foreign uh, donors uh, play, uh, foreign governments, foreign uh, corporate organizations, and foreign individuals, businessmen, and so on. Now, the involvement of foreign uh, donors uh, in the uh, in, in funding of humanities uh, is based uh, usually on um, um, the uh, relevance of uh, the, the kind of liberal education that uh, huma uh, the humanities in or the traditional humanities in traditional universities offer to students, uh, potential graduate students from the country of origin of those uh, potential donors. And if uh, we were to follow this uh, trend of um, transformation of humanities into a more vocational, and this is perhaps exaggerated, but on the whole, the subtext suggests that the vocational aspect as opposed to the more traditionally academic nature of humanities is the, the, the next thing, is the, is the hot potato here. Therefore, uh, maybe you might find, you, you may be finding yourself sacrificing the foreign graduate students, foreign PhDs, who actually uh, come to get this kind of education that uh, might uh, be marginalized because of the marketability problem. So uh, I wonder what would be your uh, take on that? Well, it's an interesting problem. I actually see more international students coming for sciences and social science degrees than humanities degrees. But assume that that was an important percentage and we would lose, I mean, we would lose diversity if we lost those students. I don't think anything that we're advocating is um, necessarily going to mean the end of the traditional PhD. You know, what we're advocating is an increase in um, diverse employment opportunities. We're not advocating ending the sort of research depth of the PhD, right? And we're actually not advocating anything much different than they do in the sciences. One thing I'd wanted to say about the science and humanities divide is that humanities are kind of a, the canary in the coal mine for academia in the US. So when you find humanities, employment goes down, but then the next thing you hear is this employment in the sciences has gone down as well, and social sciences. The, the difference may be that social sciences and the sciences have always been more um, sort of adaptable to different types of job markets, right? Um, they may occasionally reject that characterization, but um, I think probably the percentage of people in science PhDs that do not go into academic teaching is, you know, probably about the same as it is for the humanities. So, um, so I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think anyone wants to lose the richness or the depth of humanities education um, or to sacrifice that to the needs of the job market. I think that bringing diverse employment opportunities for every level, undergraduate and up, um, increases um, the potential for students to actually focus on the depth of that kind of work. If students, I mean, even my undergrads, the seniors coming in to talk to me this year, out of five in my, I have, I have 12 in a senior thesis seminar, which is our top English majors. Um, out of the five that came two weeks ago to my office hours, two of them cried because of the job market stuff they were encountering. Right, so they had incredible high levels of anxiety about the job, about the kinds of employment they were going to find when they left the academy. We've got to do something to reduce that anxiety and to help them manage that transition, whether it's the undergrad, the MA, or the PhD students. Thank you, Catherine. When the um, elephant in the room meets the canary in the coal mine, <laughs> I think we've <laughs> reached and the eats, point. The, eats the apples and the oranges. <laughs> <laughs> and plucks the low-hanging fruit. I think we've reached the point when uh, 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 we could, uh, when, 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 a, when, a, when a break will be welcome, and uh, we, I'm sure we can carry on this conversation. I I shall ponder for a long time the um, uh, the thought that 
most literature is studied in literature departments, and that <laughs> ought to make them the most humane places <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Lots to think about. Thank you again, Catherine, for a very interesting question.